new students in CLAS, I wanted to welcome you to our panel on COVID-19, which we have titled Academic Musings on COVID-19. I'm Dr. Margaret Quinlan and, and an associate professor in the Department of Communication Studies and the director of the Health and Medi Medical Humanities minor. We also have with us Dr. Sam Fur Rogers, who is a lecturer and a graduate faculty member in the Department of Biological Sciences. And we also have Dr. Andrea Freitas, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Anthropology. First up, we have Dr. Sam Fur Rogers to tell us a little bit more about her perspectives on COVID-19. So as Dr. Quinlan said, my name is Dr. Sam. Um, I'm a lecturer in the Department of Biological Sciences here at UNCC. My past and present research focuses on viruses and our immune system, how our cells respond to infections, and um, also disease epidemiology. So currently, I work in an immunology lab here in the department, and I also teach introductory biology for non-majors and a few classes that are for biology majors. And so while I love viruses, and bacteria and things that make you sick. I am also very passionate about science communication and education, which brings me to our current topic, um, COVID-19. So COVID-19, what it is, is it's the disease that's caused by a virus called SARS-CoV-2, and that just stands for Sudden Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus Number 2. So while it's related to some other previously known viruses that cause human disease, this one is new to us. It was first observed in humans in December of 2019. Um, the World Health Organization declared it a public health emergency of international concern in January of 2020. And since then, as you all know, we have seen the pandemic spread around the globe. The number of people who are infected has grown exponentially. We have seen entire countries go into lockdown, our own university. Uh, we moved to remote instruction this past spring and, you know, Throughout all of this, what we've seen is that leading scientists and public health organizations change their recommendations. However, this is exactly what we expect to see when science works. I wanna talk a little bit about science because of course that's my background. Science is a process, it's a method, it's ever changing. It's not just a static body of facts. So seeing scientists change their views as new evidence comes to light is a good thing, right? And it means that we're learning, we're adjusting our views rather than clinging to our biases or our old misconceptions. And that's just simply how science works by nature. So, you know, a good example, science used to think that diseases um, like the plague were caused by smelling poisonous air coming from rotting flesh. And so you had those infamous beak-like masks that were worn by the plague doctors. Well, those aren't worn anymore because we now know that infectious diseases are spread by germs, right? So how do we know what we know? How did we learn that microbes cause disease and not smells in the air? <laughs> so as scientists, we make observations, we gather information, we design and do experiments, uh, we analyze all of the information and the data that we've collected. And then we can take all that, that body of knowledge and we can publish it. We publish in scientific journals. Um, at that point, the findings can be made more accessible to the general public through things like the media, which of course um, can be a good or a bad thing. Um, but either way, it's, it's very exciting as a scientist to discover something in the lab, something that no one else has ever known before. And so when it comes to COVID-19, we can, we can look at three different types of science. And we can talk about some things that scientists know about the disease and the virus that causes it. So let's start sort of um, at the bottom of our steps. We start with basic science research, and we can also call that bench talk research because that's literally a scientist sitting at a bench and doing experiments, but it's what provides the foundation of knowledge about a particular topic. So, you know, this could be the discovery of genes or proteins, um, determining what they do inside of a cell. Either way, it's a very important first step for us. You know, imagine a mechanic trying to fix an engine who, who doesn't know how the engine works, right? So that's basic science or bench top research. And so for COVID-19, there's been a lot of, of leeway that's been made here. So scientists have isolated the virus, SARS-CoV-2. It's available for research in the general scientific community. So, you know, you can go online and order some coronavirus if you'd like, if you work in a lab. 
So labs working with the virus, they've determined its structure. You've probably seen the picture. We showed it on our introductory slide. Um, the entire genome of the virus was published just a month after it was first reported. We know how it gets into your cells. We know how it makes you sick. So there's a lot of work that's been done there. After we figure out, you know, the parts of the engine and how they work, the next step would be to move to translational research. Translational research aims to take the findings from basic science and create techniques and tools for treating human disease. Um, things like developing treatments and interventions, testing their efficacy in you know, cell culture or in animal models. You know, for example, if we know how the virus gets into the cell, which we figured out in the lab, is there something we could create that can block that interaction from happening and be sort of like a treatment or a preventative measure for the virus? And so that's exactly what scientists are doing for COVID-19. Scientists are working to identify antiviral drugs that can prevent or treat infection. Um, of course, developing a vaccine has been at the forefront of research efforts. In fact, there are over 165 candidates all around the world, and at least 30 of them have moved on um, to the last step, sort of. Um, we call those clinical trials. So clinical research is that last step, and it's testing the findings on humans. Are they safe? and effective. You know, a drug or a vaccine, it might show promise in our cell culture, but humans are infinitely more complex than a, a petri dish of cells. Um, so clinical research involves rigorously controlled clinical trials, and in fact, in the United States, we have an investigational vaccine. It's called mRNA-1273, and it has entered phase three uh, clinical trials, which is like the last step. There's phase one, two, and three. It entered that at the end of July. There's lots of others out there, too. In fact, um, Russia just announced that they had approved their vaccine. Um, however, they did skip the phase three trials. So how do we protect ourselves um, while science happens? While our scientists are at the bench or out in the field or at the bedside um, trying to work with this virus and figure out what's going on. Well, we know that a safe and effective vaccine is needed to ultimately control the pandemic. But you know, in the meantime, we can do things like wear masks, we can practice physical distancing, uh, proper isolation and quarantine of infected people. Um, all of this can help to slow down the spread of coronavirus. And with that, I will pass the baton to Dr. Freitas. Thanks, Dr. Sam. Hi, it's Dr. Freitas, the Department of Anthropology. Welcome to UNCC. I'm going to provide a really quick background as to what um, UN, what anthropology is. Um, and also what the project is that I've been working on. Um, so first, anthropology. It's the study of humans, life, past and present. We have four subfields. So we have biological anthropology, which is the study of um, uh, genetics and evolution. It also includes forensic anthropology and primatology. We have linguistic anthropology, which is the study of language. We have archaeology, which are our diggers who study past material culture. And civilizations and then we have sociocultural anthropology which is what I am studying contemporary culture. Within sociocultural anthropology um, there's the subfield of medical anthropology which I also am and we study the intersection of health disease and culture. All four subfields can be applied and I so I am technically an applied medical anthropologist. I know that's a mouthful. Um, but that means that I take the tools and methods and theories of anthropology and apply them to solve real world problems. So what are those tools, methods, and theories that I'm talking about? Well, I can't go into too much detail, but very briefly, um, our, core our core concept is culture. So we really are looking at the human experience with an, with an effort to understand and acknowledge the way that culture and the, the cultural and social um, context shapes the way that we both live and understand our lives. Uh, we are also known for taking a holistic perspective so that when we study something, we really want to study the political, the economic, the historical, the cultural, the religious background that goes into shaping the experiences of our research participants and the communities within which we work. We're also known for doing qualitative research, although nowadays we do a whole host of different types of research methods, but as kind of a core of our discipline, it's long-term field work where we really get to know a community and understand its needs and desires. Um, but we also do really focus on in-depth, open-ended interviews, narratives, life stories, focus groups, open-ended questions that are kind of like 
you know, so what are you excited about coming to UNCC? That would be an open-ended question where it gives the student or the participant the chance to answer in any way they see fit. And those really are the basics of our discipline. So how are we using this in the context of COVID-19? So I'm studying right now this summer um, the impact COVID-19 has had on long-term congregate care in Mecklenburg County. And so those who are not from North Carolina, Charlotte is in Mecklenburg County. And by congregate care, what I'm referring to are nursing homes, so skilled nursing homes, assisted living facilities, memory care units for those people who suffer from dementia or dementia-related illnesses, and adult family care homes that are smaller um, institutions for congregate care, so you know, eight to 10 people at most. Um, what we do know about COVID is that it really does differentially impact older Americans. So some of you have may felt this, not visiting grandparents or neighbors or friends who are 65 and over um, is something that has been really talked about at the public health level, that this is an at-risk population. But particularly at risk are those who are living in congregate care. So if we remember back to when the pandemic really hit the United States, it made news when it really overtook a nursing home in Washington State. And residents disproportionately were impacted and died, and staff actually became infected at high rates. And the same has happened as the virus has moved across the country. And Mecklenburg County is no different. So of all COVID-related deaths in North Carolina, 40% occur in adult congregate care. So that being a major issue and a major demographic to study, what we've been looking at in our project our direct care worker perceptions of providing care during COVID-19. What we're doing is focusing on those workers who are actually in these facilities because in March, our governor shuttered all congregate care and has not opened them yet. And so we are now looking at over 150 days where residents have not seen family or friends and have only had contact with direct care workers. And one thing to note about direct care workers, which kind of touches that um, the way we value certain professions and people and populations in our culture that I can answer questions about. They are um, minimum wage workers, certified nurse assistants who are doing the bulk of the labor of making sure our older American loved ones um, are getting fed, are getting showered, um, are getting moved around in the ways that they need to be moved in order to maintain their muscle mass. Our minimum wage workers who are asked at this time to, to take on a very risky, job because of high infection rates um, and they're adding to that labor the need to stimulate residents because they're not having therapies they're not seeing loved ones and so we're really asking this population what are your needs what are your concerns what are your fears what can we do for you to make you safe and feel good about your job and what can we do for residents since we can't talk to them either so that's what we've been working on for this project. All of this data is, is going through the Area Agency on Aging, because one of the things applied scholars do is collaborate with local partners to make sure that our data is actually used to implement change. So it's going to the advocacy groups and the Area Agency on Aging to solicit funds and support from both the federal and state government. So that's what you can do with your anthropology degree. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Quinlan. Thank you, Dr. Samfer Rogers. I'm Dr. Margaret Quinlan in the Department of Communication Studies. My research tends to explore and critique power structures and work towards marginalizing um, or empowering marginalized individuals that my research tends to focus on structures that enable and constrain and empower those um, involved within and outside the US medical establishment in terms of receiving and giving care. Um, so my research tends to be interested in examining the intersections between public perceptions of science, medicine, and technology, and the role communication plays in understanding science and health. So there's a lot of interesting overlaps in all three of our research. So what do we know um, from a communication perspective? I'm interested in understanding COVID-19 by exploring what does it mean to be a medical expert, right? What's the difference between a medical expert and an authority, right? People, as we know, are struggling to understand who the expert is, 
um, or who experts are and who is an authority, right? That we see images of an authority who is um, President Trump going into um, PPE plants, not wearing masks, throwing dirty masks into bins, which then contaminates all of the material in there, right? Where we have experts at the CDC, like such as Dr. Fauci and those who study infectious disease, right? So people are studying um, or having trouble understanding and listening sometimes to the voice of experts, that there's misinformation in the media, especially on social media, which is leading to increased cases of people not wearing masks. Uh, we keep seeing different conspiracy theories emerging. Um, as a communication scholar who's interested in health campaigns, right, what motivates people to change or maintain be behavior are some of the things that, that we're exploring. So how do we know what we know? And how it, so as somebody who studies communication again, um, who's interested in understanding scientific research, um, I've been listening to um, experts who are testifying as we all have been. I've been reading peer reviewed journal articles. I've been listening to health communication and public health professionals who are creating campaigns about social distancing, wearing masks. And I'm also paying attention to where blame is being placed um, in terms of who's causing the virus and where where people are talking about issues of personal responsibility versus social responsibility. So what is in dispute um, in the media and in different communication um, venues, right? That we're seeing that scientific facts and uncertainties are moving targets, that COVID-19 information environment tends to be pretty partisan and science must engage um, politically without um, obvious um, partisanship, right? And so although we know that scientific facts, as we've been talking about, continue to shift about the virus, um, it, you know, we're trying to understand how, how the virus works, um, but that doesn't mean that what we know necessarily about viruses is changing. We're just learning how this reflects what we already know. And as a communication scholar, I'm listening to those messages. So some advice that I have would be to take a variety of classes within and outside um, CLAS. You know, you're welcome to take um, health communication classes, science literacy classes, research methods, argumentation, medical history. Um, as um, some, you know, I hope that if you are interested in taking, you know, a health campaign class, um, that we would be able to, to, you know, to look at some of the campaigns that we're seeing, you know, thinking about how certain communities are being shut out of the conversations, how we can warn against the disease without stigmatizing people who already have COVID-19, um, and, you know, think about some of choices people are making, whether to get tested or not, or not tested. And then finally, um, as somebody who's in the medical humanities and who is the director of that program, that I wanted to draw your attention to what it is that we do, right? That the medical humanities allows us to make sense of experience, of the experience of providing and receiving care and understand cultural components of disease and the impact of, heart, of art and other, other aspects of it. So we keep seeing all of the death statistics related to COVID-19. Um, but what I'm interested in is how can we humanize the experience of these statistics, right? Listening to patients tell their stories of their experiences, right? Listening to people on the front line, such as healthcare workers who are talking about the pain and suffering and stress of, of the pandemic, right? And listening to, to people share these stories will help us to, um, you know, to to in, improve these statistics and, um, and understand more and, and dig a little deeper, right? Just last week, we found out that hair loss is, is a new symptom and that's something that I've um, experienced in March. And so I'm waiting for my antibody tests to come back. And so every day, new information changes, which, which um, or we keep learning new information, which, which is exciting. So look forward to, um, to discussing this more with you. Dr. Sam, can you elaborate on why the mask recommendations have changed and will masks and physical distancing protect students, faculty, and staff as we return to campus? Sure, thank you for that question, Dr. Quinlan. Um, so, you know, the whole concept 
of masking is really just another great example of science at work. You know, early in the pandemic in the U.S., masks were not recommended. Um, some reasons for that were we had low community transmission. There was not very many cases. Um, as Dr. Friedis mentioned, I think most of them were sort of um, confined to that um, nursing home that was in Washington. And so at that point, I think that the, the powers that be were hesitant to tell everyone in the country to wear a mask. Um, there was also fear of using masks that would be needed by the healthcare workers if the pandemic did continue to spread through the country. Um, we did see some of that, the shortage of the PPE equipment and the personal protective equipment in some other countries. Um, however, as we understood more about how the virus spreads, that basic sciences, that basic science and translational research as it you know, got, got its gears spinning, um, we, we learned that asymptomatic people could be spreaders. Um, more studies were done to show that the masks were actually pretty efficient at preventing the spread. And so the recommendations changed, um, as we see in science. Um, obviously, those shifting guidelines, they, they did sow some confusion um, among the public about the usefulness of masks. But you know, here's just another thing to remember, that science by nature is dynamic. We learn new things every day. And then we apply them as we go, you know. And so, if we look at the data now, um, we know that wearing a mask can help protect you, and it can protect those around you. There's experimental data that shows that masks reduce the droplet transmission, which is the main way that um, the coronavirus is spread from person to person. There's epidemiological data where we can look at real-world situations, and we can see when people are masking, the number of cases goes down. Um, so. You know, as we return to campus in the fall, the university has implemented several of these um, recommendations to always wear a mask when you're indoors. Um, we're going to practice uh, physical distancing. So, you know, all of these things can help slow the spread of COVID-19. So if we all just kind of practice good hygiene, wash our hands, um, the physical distancing, the wearing of masks, stay home if you feel sick, you know, obviously it's not going to, to prevent everything, but it can certainly go a long way in helping to reduce the spread at our university. So, Dr. Fridas, I have a question for you, actually. Um, so, as an anthropologist, how do you see social or perhaps cultural values evident in your work that you were describing for us earlier? That is a great question, Dr. Sam. Um, one of the things that we really acknowledge throughout this is that there have been problems with infection control and care in general in long-term care communities for a long time. Um, and that this pandemic has just made evident um, large disproportionate discrepancies in funding and care um, for this particular population, which um, gerontologists and those that work in this field have said um, our result of the ageism that's evident in our society, that we in our society don't value older Americans and older humans the way other cultures and societies do. And I think we can see that some of us have seen the rhetoric or the discourse in the news about when to start opening up. So while congregate care communities are closed, um, the economy has gone through very different phases and they, you know, phase one, phase two, phase three, Congregate care has not been included in any of these discussions yet. Um, and when people have decided um, as political leaders to open against public health advice, um, one of the things that they openly acknowledge is that there will be a sacrifice. That we know that to save some modicum of economic activity, we will have to sacrifice the health and lives of certain people. And we know who those people are because they're the ones who are already dying at higher rates. And so, there's this clear trade-off of we're going to open up because we need people to have their jobs and their incomes. And at, at what cost, we know people will die and it will be older Americans. And we feel comfortable with that as a society in general. And I think those are the issues that we really have to be introspective about in terms of how do we value human life, what kinds of human life, and maybe we ought to rethink that a little bit. Um, in an interview with the city commissioner, Susan Hardin, she really fought for a lot. The, the, the city got the county got $32 million from the federal government. Um, only $1 million was earmarked for congregate care, even though 40% of deaths are related to congregate care. So there's a clear disconnect that $31 million went to small businesses, individual families, all kinds of other projects. $1 million, that was it, went to all of congregate care in Mecklenburg County. 
And so what we as anthropologists do is we look at the data and think about how does it reflect who we are as a society? Because until we actually address some of these inequalities and the justice issues behind them, we'll never really see change in terms of that ad, in, in terms of moving resources to where they need to be to serve these kinds of populations. So that kind of gives you a sense of how we take our field and our values and use them in our research. I think that's absolutely great. And one thing that I would like to add um, when it comes to you know, the masking that we were talking about earlier, I think that a lot of the general population um, who do not want to wear masks because perhaps they don't feel like they are at risk, you know, they, by, by wearing the mask, what they're doing is they're helping to protect the populations like you are working with. The older individuals or those who are predisposed to getting sicker if they got the virus. And so, you know, wearing a mask isn't just about protecting yourself, it's about being a bigger member in society and helping to protect others as well. Yes, thank you, I completely agree. <laughs> Dr. Quinlan, what motivates college students to make healthy choices related to COVID-19? It's interesting. So I've done some research on e-cigarettes and what we found was students tend to, college students tend to be more influenced by social implications rather than long-term impact. And so what motivates students potentially in this, in this pandemic, is thinking about canceled um, football um, games, you know, thinking about graduation delays, thinking about canceling, you know, parties and, and things like that, where um, students um, tend to be less influenced by long-term impacts such as heart and lung issues um, and other, other long-term impacts that we might see. Um, however, what's a little interesting to see, right, is you see those students in um, Connecticut who were out partying in, you know, massive numbers, people who, um, students who went out on spring break during a global pandemic. Um, we see videos of students at Chapel Hill who are, you know, out partying um, before classes begin. And so thinking, um, I guess I would like to hear from from college students really what what motivates you right to to change behavior to rethink um and a lot of you have been doing the really hard work of wearing masks and social distancing and have probably felt um isolated like myself right from from others and from the college experience and so really thinking about and talking about what decisions you're making um, in order to protect the vulnerable um, elderly, right? Thinking about um, how to protect even healthcare workers, such as those working in nursing homes and other places who are out on the front line doing their best to protect marginalized populations. And so um, this is a great opportunity for us to discuss some of these issues and what we can do as a community um, to keep UNC Charlotte safe. and. Um, keep us on track in our majors and get football up and running and you know all the things that that we really enjoy um, and and just have it be another another great year when 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 we start up again. <laughs> 